It is Hawaii Public Radio, all things considered, and I'm Dave Lawrence. That is Street Cafe, one of the new recordings on a collection that is out today from Moody Blues legend John Lodge, Beyond the Very Best Of, the release of hand-picked deeper cuts, favorites, new recordings of both solo and Moody Blues tracks, and even some remix songs you'll know from classic albums that you might have grown up with. John wrote some Moody Blues monsters too, songs like I'm Just a Singer in a Rock and Roll Band and Ride My Seesaw. This Rock and Roll Hall of Famer just did the Royal Affair Tour during which we recorded this conversation on the same bill with Yes, Asia, ELP's Carl Palmer. He's got another cruise appearance early next year. It includes our buddies Jerry Beckley and uh, Dewey Bunnell from America. And somehow we will find out how he finds time to make wine, too, we will hear as we welcome this ferocious animal to all things considered. It's the Moody Blues, John Lodge. Aloha and mahalo, my friend. Yeah, I, how you doing, Dave? <laughs> What's going on, brother? Hello, it's you. Oh, I haven't been to Hawaii for some time. I'm feeling quite jealous, actually. <laughs> Hi, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to hopefully lure you back by uh, giving you massive respect and appreciation for you taking some time. And a great day it is. This record is just dropping today, so so it's really timely. And this release, uh, Beyond the Very Best of, John, Explain how you come up with uh, the re-recording of both the, uh, you got the Street Cafe, but then two more tunes, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm really excited now, Dave, because, you know, for recording, I, I was approached by BMG, uh, some real music people there, a guy called Hartwick, who, uh, who's CEO, and uh, Peter Stack, who's uh, the uh, manager, uh, general manager over there in the UK. And they're real music people, and we were talking, and uh, I got excited about going back in the studio again. And um, so we talked about uh, the best way of, of, of doing it, what I would like to do. And I said, well, I've, I've been playing on stage uh, some deep cuts from... Uh, uh, from my albums and uh, songs from, uh, say, Days of Future Past, Evening Time to Get Away, which is buried on the uh, second side of the album. And I thought it'd be really nice to get back in the studio and record them as though uh, I've recorded them today, as though they're new songs, really, re really fresh. And uh, so I started looking at some other deep cuts, and uh, I realized I'd, I'd written a song called... Uh, written a song called Street Cafe, and uh, Street Cafe uh, was never released in the USA. And uh, I thought, well, I'd like to go back in the studio and re-record that, which I did. And, um, and so it all started to uh, uh, manifest itself. And then I thought well, it'd be really good to go back to Natural Avenue. And um, there was a movie released last year called Private, Private Lives, and they released um, Say You Love Me from Natural Avenue. So I went and found the original 24 tracks uh, of that album uh, and baked them because, you know, they probably wouldn't play properly anymore. Baked them, <laughs> right. digitized them, and went back in the studio and uh, uh, remixed them uh, for a 2019 mix. And basically, that's how I put the album together. And I thought, I'll get Roger Dean to do the artwork. And uh, Roger loved the idea. And it, 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 and that's why I came up with the title, Beyond, because it's sort of beyond the deep cuts. It's taken them out of where they were and hopefully put them uh, where we are today and maybe in the future. I like that. It's a great summary. And Roger Dean, for folks who are listening, if you're a fan of those classic, really psychedelic early 70s Yes records and some of the Asia records and other work, that's who that artist is. So that's what's given uh, John a very cool, hip, kind of 70s retro artwork package uh, when you mentioned the Roger Dean, just to, so that other people can be included in what we're talking about here. And you mentioned something neat. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to play you a question that I got from our uh, operations manager. He also hosts our evening jazz show. He's a huge, huge Moody Blues fan. And we were talking the other day about the process of saving old music and, and thinking about taking classics like you're talking about here. Again, John Lodge from the Moody Blues talking about beyond the very best of and 
Going back to some of those original recordings when you were talking about the remixing process, you mentioned baking the original tapes. Now, for the folks listening who are just not, they haven't done 50 years in the music business, they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, try to explain to them what you're talking about, because I think they'll laugh. Well, a, a tape has is, 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 is got a magnetic field on it, which records everything, and it oxidizes. And once, once if it, the tape is really old, and it's been sitting in a vault somewhere for like 30 years, 40 years. <laughs> the oxidation takes place between each of the, t the tape, you know, between uh, as the tape is in a roll. You can imagine it all, it's all sticking together and everything. And once you play it once, you'll probably lose a lot of the sound, a lot of the magnet magnetic sound on that. Uh, so what you do, you bake it, which holds it all in situ for really one play and then you record that digitally the play you do you you play it to the machine but you digitize it so you've kept it exactly what the digital um uh, exact copy of what is on the tape and, and, and then you can then do what you like with it on computers and uh, uh you know th through your mixing boards and you're just baking it for one play, basically, that one critical play. And this is to ensure that when you do do that play, it will come out with the best possible condition. Yeah, because otherwise, um, you know, if you try and play an old tape, you, uh, if you ask anyone if anyone's got an old cassette, play it nowadays and see what happens. It probably goes a long bit and then it just disappears, the sound, or it goes, <laughs> you know, bassy and fluffy and everything else. And you think, well, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that in the 60s or 70s or 80s. <laughs> You're funny. Now, when you do this tour, the uh, Royal Affair Tour, which is, again, when we're recording this conversation, uh, and I think of uh, your presentation on stage, how much do you do you dig into these new... Do you reference this process of doing this record? Do you tell some of these cool stories when you're doing it? And you're using your, your 10,000 Light Years band, too, backing you up, right? Yeah, I am. Uh, actually, on, on the tour I'm doing right now, because uh, there's so many artists on the tour, uh, and it's a four-hour show uh, we're doing, uh, there's really not much time to talk about the songs, because I think it's more important I play the songs. And uh, so I'm doing songs uh, like uh, Stepping Into Slide Zone, but sort of a deep cut as well. I'm playing Saved by the Music uh, from Blue Jays. But I'm also playing a uh, legend of a mind from my friend Ray Thomas, who uh, unfortunately died last year of the Moody's, a flute player. Uh, I wanted to keep Ray's music alive. So I'm doing uh, uh, sort of eight songs, which sort of really encompass uh, my the songs I've written over the years, you know, and uh, uh, I'm having a great time with it. I'm getting John Davison from Yes to come on, uh, and he, he joins me for the encore of Ride My Seesaw. So, yeah, we're having a great time. I love that kind of talk. Now, you mentioned Ray, and I was going to get you to do a, uh, when I think about it, this is, again, he re you recently, John recently worked with and then lost this major partner from the Moody Blues, flute player, singer, founding member of the Moody Blues, Ray Thomas. If you can, take us back to first meeting him and, and pay tribute to things about him maybe you'd like him to know that you're grateful for about your relationship. Uh, well, I met Ray when I was probably 14. Uh, I got on a bus and uh, I saw this guy stand on the bus and uh, I, I said to him, uh, don't you play in a pop band uh, at the uh, church hall on a Thursday evening in the U club? And he said, yes, I do. He said, I said, what's your name? He said, I'm Ray Thomas. And I said, well, I'm John Lodge. Uh, I said, I play as well. Do you fancy forming a band? <laughs> and we did. We formed a band and uh, the band was called L Riot and the Rebels, and we used to wear Mexican outfits, can you believe? Uh, even, even, we even bought sombreros, but they only lasted about two concerts because we lost them. Uh, but we, we dressed up as even Mexican outfits, can you believe? I mean, the things you did, we were like 16 and 17, and uh, I taught Ray how to drive a car. I passed my test first. Ray was older than me, uh, 
but uh, he won't mind me saying that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I taught him how to drive, gave him his first driving lessons. So we did really grow up together. And, uh, you know, his parents and my parents became really good friends uh, just because of us. And they were stayed friends until, until, unfortunately, my parents died and Ray's parents died. But right up until the end, they were still all great friends going on vacation together. And Ray's children and my children have kept in touch and uh, they are friends. Uh, in actual fact, uh, you know, I've recorded um, Legend of the Mind for Ray on the album. And Ray's son, Adam, has just been in touch with me and... Uh, he just thanked me for keeping his dad's music alive. So, um, yeah, it's 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 uh, more than just music. It's it's just been a friendship. And I just have to tell you one story for for everyone out there, which Please. you probably like. Please, uh, when 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 we were nominated uh, uh, for the Hall of Fame, uh, Ray wasn't very well, and this is sort of just before Christmas. And he rang me up. He said, "Hey, John." They said, uh, we've been nominated for the Hall of Fame. I said, yeah. He said, does this mean we're famous now? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, after all these years. <laughs> and that's Ray's sense of humour. Does this mean we're famous because we've made it into the Hall of Fame? And, uh, uh, and it was a sad day because uh, when, when the presentation was going to be, he rang me up and said... Um, I'm not going to be, be able to make it. Would you, uh, could you collect it for me on my behalf? I said, yeah, of course I will. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away just before the uh, the ceremony. But uh, you know, uh, Ray will always be with me. Always be with me anyway. It's real heavy, and he was a partner in your last uh, go around on a solo effort too, right before. Uh... Yes, he did. I I I've written the song for my grandson called Simply Magic, and I rang Ray up. I said, "I've written this song. Uh, get the flute out and come and play it <laughs> on this song." And uh, <laughs> so I went round to his house because he lived he lived just a mile from me. Ray, we used to, had the same doctor. We saw each other regularly, and I went round and. Uh, Played in the song, and he he said, "Yeah," and he learned all the uh, parts for the flute. And we went into the studio and recorded uh, uh, the song. And while we were in there, I said, "Why don't we ring Mike as well in in California and get him to come and play Mellotron?" Which I did. I rang Mike up and said, "Would you come and play Mellotron on this song?" And he did, you know. And uh, it was just a great time for me because it sort of completed the circle. Because uh, I hadn't worked with Mike for many, many years, uh, so Mike was on my album and Ray, and uh, you know things worked out fabulously for the record. And uh, at least Ray did something just before he, he departed this earth with me. So fabulous. That's a wonderful tribute. Mike Pinder is the name that uh, he's uh, talking about there. John Lodge again, Moody Blues uh, legend and sharing some deep stories, taking us back to uh, cats that he spent a lifetime with. And it makes you think, you know, sometimes when I talk to people from your, your neck of the woods in England, John is from the Birmingham area. I always wonder about different other exports because doing radio, you meet other cats who are from Birmingham through the years and you start to think, hmm, I wonder how much cross path there might be between like Black Sabbath and you go to generationally English beat, Steel Pulse. These are just some of the people, John Bonham. And then I was looking online. I saw John likes motorcycles. I saw on your Instagram, you're sitting on a big one. I thought, hmm, Rob Halford from Judas Priest. He's a, another Birmingham guy. How, how much did you get into any of those bands that are from your area? Well, I think we, I think a lot of us grew up together. And it was, it was like a big wave that lasted for about four or five years, you know, because when, when I grew up, it, I grew up with people like Spencer Davis, Stevie Winwood, we were all playing the same little clubs together and getting about 10 guineas a night <laughs> between all of us. Uh, and uh, so we were all working together and uh, Roy Wood, uh, Jeff Lynn with bands like Idle Race, before the move, you know, bands before the move uh, and before ELO. Uh, and uh, we were all playing all in these same little clubs around Birmingham. It was an incredible period of time. Uh, UB40, of course, 
uh, uh, so, just so many people. Uh, John Bonham. You know. John Bonham. John Bonham. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Robert Plant was right. from Wolverhampton, but he spent a lot of time in Birmingham, you know, <laughs> only around the corner, really, you know, and... Uh, um, uh, and a band I found called Trapeze with uh, Glenn Hughes of course. and Mel, Ga- and Mel Galley. Um They're all from the same area, you know. We uh, we all played all the same venues, and uh, it was like a huge wave. And you um, produced uh, that band, Trapeze, with Glenn Hughes, who you're yeah. talking about, who would go on to sing with Sabbath and sing with Deep Purple and is just a very talented singer. Yeah, White Snake and Judas Priest and everything, you know. So um, it was, it was a, just a great time. And, uh, uh, you, you know, the Moody Blues, or myself, before the Moody Blues, we were in, as I said, Ray and I were with, with, with another band, but we were trying to find our own music, you know. We try and recreate our own songs. You'd see other bands and think, "Yeah, they're doing that. That's fantastic." But we've got to do something else, you know. And that's what we did. Uh, you did some really original, unbelievably pioneering kinds of flavors with your music. And on the note of that, in fact, funny enough, uh, different kinds. Of, and you probably can really appreciate this, having a, the longevity you are so blessed to have, and it really is a blessing. Um, on the note of those classic releases, fans sometimes get tripped up, John, by different versions of songs where perhaps songs have been remixed or sometimes in the remastering. There will be instruments that get deleted or added from a mix. And so we have this, uh, our operations manager, he hosts our evening jazz show. It's called uh, Evening Jazz, and Charles uh, Husson is his name. And he's the biggest Moody Blues fan that I know. And so I recorded him. He had a he had a statement about that exact issue that I just mentioned, and I wanted to play his a recording of that and, and get your comment on it. It's on one of your classic records. Okay, I'm just going to play you his audio. You should be able to hear it pretty good. Hang on one sec here. I just ordered the 50th anniversary box set of Days of Future Past so I could get the original mix because I hate the 1972 remix so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I do. <laughs> and I do. You, you know, I, I agree with him uh, 100% because that was done by the record company uh, without really our knowledge. And um, uh, it's it's a really strange thing that people take it on themselves to do these things. <laughs> I have this incredible thing that I always say. What we did when we mastered it originally, that was how we heard it and it should not be done any other way. And I think that was really, really important uh, for me because I, I don't want... Uh, it's, it's when there's outtakes turn up as well. It's like, yeah, we didn't put the outtake on because we didn't think it was good enough. Right, it wasn't on uh, for a reason is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, it was not on for a reason. <laughs> and... Uh, so it, it's important to me that, uh, and I agree with him, and it's really important, I, you know, sometimes you put on uh, uh, a radio station, you listen to the record, and you go, that's not the original. Right. That's not the original. Where have <laughs> they got this version from? And uh, it annoys me. <laughs> it annoys me because um, if you're really into music, you should really find the originals. You find the originals because they're the ones that made it happen. That's the one that happened in the studio that turned the artist on, turned the engineer on, turned the producer on. That's the one that really, really got everyone excited. I love it. You had a great reaction. He'll get a kick out of that. I'm sure you're making him smile big time. And uh, one other, he said, <laughs> and he said, uh, and this is seriously, John, I'm not kidding. In my entire life, I'm 48. I've not met no one who is as big a fan of your, of you and your band than this guy, Charles. And he said one other thing. He said, if there is one message you could pass along for me, it's this to our children's children's children has been my favorite since I bought it and Candle of Life along with Watching and Waiting is the high spot on the album for me. The core seven albums are still my favorite music of all time. Well, that's a beautiful thing to say. Thank you very much, Stu. Yep. Really beautiful. Thank you. I love passing stuff. You know, when you, when you sit in the studio at four o'clock in the morning and you're working on a track and everything and you think... I wonder if someone's going to hear this. <laughs> exactly. And then you hear that statement, 
like 40 years later, whatever, and you think, yeah, we must have done something right. Exactly, exactly. You said it. You can't say it better than that. And on that note, um, it would be it would be remiss if I didn't. You've written some of the songs that, when I was a little kid, my mom and dad rocked. My mom introduced me to Led Zeppelin and, and Jimi Hendrix and the Easy Rider soundtrack. Ah. And, and one of the kinds of things that they played on the radio that you heard all the time were some of these chestnuts that you made, John Lodge. You yourself are the writer of I'm just a singer in a rock and roll band. You've got to give us some story of writing this monster, monster radio epic. Well, it was, it was a lot of different things, but uh, the main driving force for me writing the song was uh, <clears throat> it, 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 at that period of time, uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, people were sort of bestowing on us uh, uh, credits that we didn't have, you know. Uh, they were saying things like, we know the answer to the universe, we know the answer to life, we know the answer to this, uh, we're going to be flying spaceships. I mean, <laughs> I had people turn up my house uh, in England saying that <clears throat> they've come to get on my spaceship, which I'm about to fly and save the world. And I was saying, I, actually, I don't like flying, never mind flying in a spaceship. Uh, so, it was, it was really just to say, listen, I'm just a singer in rock and roll band. I'm exactly the same as you. And that's why at the very end of the song, I actually say, we're all just singers in a rock and roll band. It's just that some of us are on stage and some of us are out there. But that's all we are. We're nothing else. We're nothing else. And um, so that's basically where the, 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 song, the song came from. But uh, there are things in there that uh, I, I had to refer to. Uh, one was the Vietnam War, to be honest. Uh, it was the photograph of the little girl running along the street uh, where everything, everything was on fire. And uh, yeah, so I put that in there. Uh, and then all the riots that people do, and really you find most of the people who are rioting they're doing it for themselves, not for us, not for you or I. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can quietly have a revolution. And I think music did that in the 60s and early 70s. We really pulled the world together. I really believe that, that music actually united the people around the world. I know when we were in playing concerts in Eastern Europe at the time, you know, you had the Iron Curtain and things like that where... Um, English and American music was not allowed, but we'd go behind there and play, and everyone loved it, you know, young people. Uh, they just want to be part of being young people around the world. And uh, we're living in strange times now, and I just uh, hope that music can actually unite everyone again, you know, and uh, try and put some harmony back in this world. When you talk like you just did, I can't help but think you're a very spiritual guy, too. Does that inform some of what you just said? I think so, yeah. I think so, because, uh, we, you know, I, I'm a musician because I love music. Uh, I'm not into music because it can make me money and make me famous. That's the last thing on my mind. I love music, and uh, I know what it does for me listening to music, and hopefully I know what it does to other people listening to music. And uh, there's a harmony, uh, and if we can spread that harmony, it's just fantastic. You have that in Hawaii. I remember going to Hawaii for the first time, uh, and I felt a real harmony in Hawaii. You know, there was something mystical, uh, whether it was about the volcanoes or not, I don't know. <laughs> but there always felt something mystical and very calming. Uh, and I think all the dancing and the music uh, in Hawaii was very calming and uh, harmonic. You know what's so cool that you brought that up? We have this guy. He is so generous. The way you're generous with all this storytelling and your good energy, there's this guy, Steve, the mystery emailer, and he emails me the history of different bands who are going to be on the show. So sometimes I'll email him and say, hey, Steve, I'm going to be talking to like John Lodge from the Moody Blues. 
can you check your records and see what his history is with the islands? So take a listen to this since you brought up that really nice testimony about the uh, Aloha State. It was January 27th and 28th, 1974, according to Steve, that the Moody Blues made their Hawaii debut, performing for two sold-out shows at the Blaisdell Arena. A concert review in a local publication, John, named Sunbums, reads as follows. The blue stage lights turned red, the stage filled with smoke, and suddenly the Moody Blues burst into view. They began their two-hour performance with Higher and Higher, continued on with, and it lists a bunch of the songs that you guys played before being called back for an encore of, and it's another song that our guest John Lodge wrote himself, Ride My Seesaw. Ticket prices for this event, do you want to take a guess at what you were, Mr. Lodge, at what you guys were selling those tickets for? Because it's going to be kind of funny. <laughs> Five dollars. <laughs> Six fifty, five fifty, and four fifty. You hit it right on the head. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, and I, I remember that as I, yesterday. We flew in from Alaska, and we flew in uh, on the first. Uh, I think it was the first Japanese. We flew to Alaska with J Japan Airlines, and uh, I remember we landed in the snow. And the windscreen broke at the plane. <laughs> Can you believe that? We were stuck in Alaska. We were stuck in Alaska then for two days, and, and then we uh, flew down to Hawaii. Yeah, what, amazing. What broke the, the like the windshield of the airplane broke? Yeah, it cracked. And you got stuck in Alaska because of that. And we got stuck there in Alaska because they had to fly another windscreen out. <laughs> <laughs> and then you came, and then you came to Hawaii afterwards, so you could you could really remember. So that you remember those exact shows, and that was your debut then, seventy four. Yeah, I remember. I remember. I remember where we stayed, the Kahala Hill. That's so funny. Where so many bands have stayed since then, and, yeah. uh, and that's where I met I met Jack, just Lord there. You met. Say that again. I met Jack Lord there, Y Five O. Wow! How did that happen? Yeah, he was he was at the hotel, and I I just went up to him and said, uh, uh, Jack, um, I'm John Lodge, Moody Blues, and we're doing a concert here, and uh, I just want to say, Y Five O is such a big show in the UK, and I just want to say, hey, you made everybody happy. Did he get a kick out of that? <laughs> yeah, he did. A quick photograph together and everything else, and uh, that was nice. What, yeah. a, what a beautiful memory. Final one, and, and then I'll let you go. Moody Blues return to Hawaii. Now, this could be, you'll fill us in, you'll help Steve out if this is, uh, Steve does not say this is the only other show, but it's the only other one he sent me. February 13th, 1987, Moody Blues returned to Hawaii, played the Blaisdell Arena, and he says, if I am not mistaken, this performance in Honolulu was taped for a future Showtime cable TV special. Ticket prices, though, John, a little bit more respectable on this one. Sixteen fifty for this one, it says. <laughs> Sixteen fifty. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. No, uh, and I've been to Hawaii a few times now for holidays with my family. We've always had a nice time. Love but, it. But those were the only two concerts, you think? I, I, they're, they're the only two times we've been there. Uh, and uh, you never know. I mean, if... Uh, if the promoters come forward, perhaps we get the Royal Affair over there. Be great. You do that. You bring the Royal Affair. You come over. Maybe do a thing with your wine, right? You're, when you're not when you're not busy. Yeah, because when you're not busy <laughs> rocking. Nice. Where do you grow your wine? Where are you growing your grapes? Uh, well, no. I, I want to do. I, I find winemakers. I find areas in the world which I really love. Uh, one of them is in California, of course, Napa and Sonoma. Uh, another one is in Bordeaux, in France. And another one is in South Africa, uh, called the Elgin Valley in uh, South Africa. And uh, I find winemakers, and uh, we talk about wine, and we blend the wine, and uh, then we make the wine, and we call it Chrisima. Uh, it has its own website, K-R-I-S-E-M-M-A, and that's from my two children's names, Christian and Emily. So, um, yeah, Chrisima.com, it's... Uh, yeah, we have some fun with this, and uh, it, it takes us around the world uh, for another reason, you know. That's what I'm saying. So try to write that into your, uh, in your say, hmm, that's a good excuse to go back to Hawaii. We'll do something <laughs> with the wine. Yeah, we, 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 should, we should come to uh, perhaps a cruise around Hawaii and do a wine-tasting music and wine event. 
We'd love to have you. We have a nice 75-seat little performance studio attached to the station. If you ever are coming through and you just wanted to do a little Q&A or play some music for a cause, I know you're a, a guy with a big heart who loves to help out people in need. You could do something like that or you know anything like that. We'd love to see you in town here. Don't don't think that uh, you know the welcome is a, it's a red carpet welcome for you, John Lodge from the Moody Blues. Beyond the very best of new release out today. And he was so kind to do this very fun, lively conversation with us and uh, giving you a huge hug, a couple of them, and big high fives. And I hope you had fun talking today. I had a great time, and thank you. And, uh, yeah, all my best wishes to everyone there in Hawaii. And uh, thank you. Cheers, Dave. Fantastic. Cheers, mate. It's John Lodge from the Moody Blues joining you. This is Hawaii Public Radio's Pledge Drive. And all things considered... I'm proud and honored to be with my friend here, Dave Lawrence. <laughs> if you want to ride this seesaw, it isn't free. Yeah, dig deep in those quarters and become a member today. This is how you do it, and thank you for supporting HPR. Fantastic. I hope that wasn't a hassle, man. I really did enjoy talking to you, John. You told some great stories. You're a great storyteller and um, just an honor to get to talk to you and to get the support for the radio station. Hopefully you like public radio, but I really do appreciate your time today, brother. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Dave. All the best to you. You too. Take care. Aloha. Bye. Aloha.